Welcome Professor Danny Stein. Uh, Professor Danny Stein is the Distinguished Professor of Political Science at uh, University of Toronto and the Founding Director of uh, one of the world's most interesting important centers, the Hmong Center. And it is an honor and a privilege to have some to spend some time with you at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem where both of us are attending a conference and um, wonderful to have this opportunity. It's so, a pleasure to be with you today, <laughs> and the Monk Center has now become the Monk School of Global Affairs wow. and Public Policy. That's impressive, and it's, it has a number of book awards and connected to foreign policy, and a very influential uh, center. I'm so, really proud of it. Yes, you, you should be. So what I uh, want to discuss with you, this is a conversation on peaceful change that we uh, now run a global research network on peaceful change. As part of that, we interview senior scholars and uh, distinguished people like you to get a sense of some of these big themes. And recently I watched some of your uh, presentations on the subject of technology and change. And I was very impressed with your uh, discussion about how rapidly technology was a unifier. You know, end of the Cold War, you have all these new technologies coming in. Suddenly, uh, we are talking about the, the wall, uh, the divider uh, role that technology is playing. Why is that so? And what do you ex what There is a politics behind it, obviously. There's always politics behind technology. Mm. And I think any argument mm. which gives a determining role to technology mm. always misses the Absolutely. point. So if I can take a step back and just talk about how the internet started. Mm. It started, um, as we all know, as a small Pentagon-funded project, yes. DARPA, yes. which was then spun out by scientists um, that built the internet to become an open platform for the public. And around that decision were what I would call utopian views yes. that the internet would be the great enabler, it was gonna be a global platform, uh, it was going to enable citizen engagement, mm. democracy, peaceful change. When you go back and read the mm. literature um, from that period, it's really remarkable. The sense even among sober-minded scholars mm. that we were on the edge of a new world, new order. world order. And one of the interesting things is to compare. It's very similar um, to the kind of um, writing you got when the Gutenberg Press um, was okay. developed, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you moved away from elite um, monopoly, people, yeah. and it was a one-to-many model, mm -hmm. and the internet, in, in a sense, was the next version of this. It was a many-to-many yes. model. Yes. But what we didn't talk about this during this period was who really built the internet, who mm. governed it, mm. and how it ran. Yes. He was an American-built mm. internet. Mm. If you look at the governance of the internet, mm. we use global language, but in fact, look at how domain names yes. are awarded. Yes. The internet, it's by an American-run organization that is, of course, located and centered mm. in the United States. Mm. What's the dominant language on the internet? Mm. It's English. English. <laughs> um, and which companies have done extremely well mm. and use the internet mm. um, to, to grow. In fact, all five big fang companies, mm. uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, mm. and Google, mm. were American headquartered yes. companies. Yes. So we, in fact, had um, three decades of an American invented, American built, an American run mm -hmm. internet, mm -hmm. which the rest of the world just talked about as global. Yes. So it's very connected to American hegemony and it it's your so called unipolar moment. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can really understand the internet yes. yeah. that it was um, a product of uh, American hegemony mm -hmm. and at a time when American power yes. was dominant in the world. Well, where are we now? Yes. Uh, and I think that's the interesting 
comparison. Mm. And really, to me, the way I think about this is I think about the development of the internet as a metaphor for world order, because mm. it tells us so much about the world order. Mm. China um, has made massive investments over the last decade and a mm. half mm. in building the next generation of internet technology, mm. right. which we talk about as 5G or mm. fifth generation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're already um, on the verge of 6G, mm. but what really matters is that China has probably the most effective mm. and the cheapest provider of 5G technology, yes. which is Huawei. Yes. Now, how, did, how did Huawei grow? That's the first question. Well, Huawei grew as a result of Chinese industrial policy. Yes. And China's not the first country to use industrial policy to grow. The United States used it. European countries used yes. it. It's just the latest yes. to use it. In a it's bit. the latest rising power using it, too. So I actually yes. consider China no longer a rising power. Risen. It's, it's, it's risen. Mm. It's arrived mm. uh, as a power. But it, mm. you're right that it's the latest rising power mm. to do it. And one of the reasons that Huawei um, is able to provide um, such good technology at such a competitive price mm. is because it's gotten significant industrial subsidies, subsidies on the first hand, but more than that, it's because it originally started as a cheap low-end provider right. of technology mm. in the Chinese market, yes. and at the low end, it yeah. did just incredible amounts of volume, and that's what generated yes. all the revenues. Yes. So let's come forward to today right mm. now. Um, the United States is putting enormous pressure on allied governments States, yeah. not to use Huawei technology to build up 5G. Yeah. And the argument is, mm. it's a security risk. Yes, it is. And there's two pieces to that argument. Mm. The first is, even with the best of intentions, there will be open back doors, yeah, yeah, yeah. which there are yeah, in yeah. every single technology right. that we use, there are open back doors. Mm. But in the Chinese case, say the Americans, the Chinese will use that advantage to listen and to spy. Yes. Now, it wouldn't matter if everything wasn't going to be connected to everything. Mm. So we are having a discussion, we can talk about the Western world first. Mm. We are having in some ways the most um, utopian discussion, hmm. and it is about core networks and periphery, uh -huh. as if one can separate. The dependency theory. <laughs> uh, yes, it, but, but it's inappropriate application <laughs> yes, of dependency yes, theory, yes. because it really, you can protect under hmm. 3G hmm. or 4G, you can imagine a core, hmm. because you look at what government infrastructure is running hmm. on. Yes. When your electricity grid and your um, air control system and your digital financial system is all running on the network, mm. it's very difficult to have a meaningful discussion about where the core is. Yes. But that's what governments are doing mm. because they are seeking to balance yes. between the United States and China. Mm. But it is the difficult thing is the Western countries are not developing this technology as fast as China. And so these allies and the neutrals or whatever you want, they all need the Chinese to come in. No? Well, I, I think also uh, that's, that's the Chinese version Chinese of the story, version, just yes. like the Americans have a version yes. of the story. <laughs> yes. First of all, Nokia and Ericsson mm. um, are competitive in terms of the quality of the technology. Mm. They're not as competitive in price. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's because they haven't had the benefit yes. of the protected market uh, that Huawei mm. has mm. had. Mm. Um, and so you see already countries, you know, Britain, mm. Germany, Canada mm. are having these agonizing discussions yes, yes, about how, Japan, Japan, South Korea already, Even India. India. Is having to, yeah. uh, although I think there's no question that India will allow Huawei mm. into into what they're calling the periphery of the market. Yeah. Then what does that really mean? Yeah. It means radar installations. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about the map mm. that we'll have of the world in two years or three years, mm. very close, mm. um, I call it the splinter net. 
That's a nice one, too. Yeah, like nice that term? Yes. So Huawei will run advanced 5G platforms yeah. for most of Asia, not for Japan. Mm. South Korea and India will be the countries to watch in Asia, mm. for most of Southeast Asia, yeah. for all of Africa, where yeah. China's already embedded, yes. um, and for a good chunk of South America. Yeah. In but, Europe, um, yeah. we'll probably, we'll certainly have Western-built mm. um, infrastructure um, in all of Europe yeah. and in Canada, certainly in the core of the network. Yeah. And here's the interesting question mm. that um, I think is an important political science question, but it's also an important policy question. Who is thinking about the digital passports? Mm. We're all going to need when we cross really? from mm. one mm. network mm. to another. We have to carry multiple uh multiple uh, exactly. cell phones. And that's what I mean by the re-bordering of But the I, have a, I have a counterpoint to make, which is, given the MNCs, the multinational corporations, are also global. They're not. I mean, they're becoming less and less. But the point is that but they... But they're not. Yeah. So let's stop over that for a minute, because everybody talks about MNCs. Mm. They're not. Mm. So one of the interesting tests mm. is to look at Alibaba sales. Okay. and where these sales are. The Chinese ones. Yeah. They're all in Chinese-speaking markets. Mm. And they sell in Canada, but they large, a tiny component of that sale mm. is to non-Chinese-speaking But sales. Western MNCs are all over the place. So. No, they're not. Mm. How much does Amazon sell in China? Mm. Nothing. It's blocked. Apple does, no? Well, but it, Apple is the only remaining one, yeah. and it's had to negotiate with the yeah. Chinese government, and its yeah. future is increasingly unclear. Russia is splintering off its net uh -huh. from the global internet. Okay. So if you actually, so talking about e-commerce companies yeah. Yeah. is actually one of the most interesting ways to highlight what I'm saying, mm. that already e-commerce companies mm. are having trouble mm. crossing that boundary and selling it to markets on either side of the Given borders. our limited time span, how do we visualize this in terms of international order, in terms of the peaceful rise of these countries, or are we going to see new types of conflict emerging? It's not going to be the industrial conflict no. of big wars, no. but this could be war too, different kind of wars, well, different wars, different divisions. But how can we avoid that? That's another big question. So I, thought, so I, I would distinguish between the challenge of avoiding conflict mm. and the challenge of avoiding war. Yes. I think the really encouraging thing is that these large industrial wars that we saw in the first half of the 20th century, I really believe are off the table. Oh, yes. And they're off the table because of a nuclear weapons, mm. um, there, which makes the fear of escalating yes. from any kind of conventional war so powerful that even the biggest powers have backed off. Mm. Conflict is ubiquitous. There's mm. no way. I mean, to talk about preventing conflicts is mm. frankly foolish. Mm. It's all about how do you manage conflict and how do you challenge mm. it. And conflict over the next 25 years, I believe, mm. will be focused on technology mm. because technology is reshaping the borders of the world. Politics, and too. And mm. politics, mm. as you say. Mm. And it's an if we think about it that way, mm. technology um, is showing us mm. the map mm. which is undergirding the divisions within the system. Yeah. And we have to think about governance. Yeah. How do we govern across boundaries? Yeah. That's the big policy That's, challenge. But one thing though, technology is so rapidly changing that today's leader may not be tomorrow's leader. Absolutely. So there is all possible scenarios, a small country like Israel, for instance, becoming the leader of certain technologies. And how do we create a global governance system whereby what you call interdependence, technological and economic interdependence uh, f uh, flourish rather than division summer? Because I think agency here matters, leadership and how we picture this thing. No? Right, so um, that's a huge question. I think it's the most important question for the next 25 years. Mm. Leaders do matter. Mm. Um, and what is discouraging mm. is the poor quality yes. of leadership so virtually true. everywhere, yes. Yes. right? Um, and whether it's in the United States, whether it's in China, Europe is turned inward looking mm. and is not providing the kind of governance leadership 
um, that it could and yeah. should. It's focused probably on the least important part of this whole story, which is privacy, hmm. which to me is almost a red herring in this hmm. discussion. And without far-sighted leaders, we don't build new governance structures. Populism is not going to work. <laughs> no, this. it won't. Yeah. But yeah. also looking back historically, T.D., mm -hmm. there is always a very long lag mm -hmm. between new forms of politics and then the governance models well, which follow. True. And you There's, need crisis sometimes. And you need a crisis, unfortunately, mm -hmm. very often. So mm -hmm. when I look at these next 15, 20 years, yes. Um, I think the fault line hmm. will be the politically driven use of technology. Yes. So this calls for us to think beyond our limited understanding of international politics and yes. go to the larger questions of how to connect technological uh, innovations and the rise of new states, new actors, right. how that affect us all in the 21st century. So thank you, Janice. It was wonderful. You're and, so welcome. Uh, very nice. A pleasure we always to be with you. Talk.